Section 7 of Old Greek Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Greek Stories by James Baldwin. Section 7 The Lord of the Silver Bow. Part 1 Delos. Long before you or I or anybody else can remember, there lived with the mighty folk on the mountain top a fair and gentle lady named Leto. So fair and gentle was she that Jupiter loved her and made her his wife. But when Juno, the queen of earth and sky, heard of this, she was very angry, and she drove Leto down from the mountain and bade all things great and small refuse to help her. So Leto fled like a wild deer from land to land, and could find no place in which to rest. She could not stop, for then the ground would quake under her feet, and the stones would cry out, Go on, go on! And birds and beasts and trees and men would join in the cry. And no one in all the wide land took pity on her. One day she came to the sea, and as she fled along the beach, she lifted up her hands and called aloud to the great Neptune to help her. Neptune, the king of the sea, heard her and was kind to her. He sent a huge fish, called a dolphin, to bear her away from the cruel land, and the fish, with Leto sitting on his broad back, swam through the waves to Delos, a little island which lay floating on top of the water like a boat. There the gentle lady found rest and a home, for the place belonged to Neptune, and the words of cruel Juno were not obeyed there. Neptune put four marble pillars under the island, so that it should rest firm upon them, and then he chained it fast, with great chains which reached to the bottom of the sea, so that the waves might never move it. By and by twin babes were born to Leto in Delos. One was a boy whom she called Apollo, the other a girl whom she named Artemis, or Diana. When the news of their birth was carried to Jupiter and the mighty folk on the mountain top, all the world was glad. The sun danced on the waters, and singing swans flew seven times round the island of Delos. The moon stooped to kiss the babes in their cradle, and Juno forgot her anger and bade all things on the earth and in the sky be kind to Leto. The two children grew very fast. Apollo became tall and strong and graceful. His face was as bright as the sunbeams, and he carried joy and gladness with him wherever he went. Jupiter gave him a pair of swans and a golden chariot, which bore him over sea and land wherever he wanted to go. And he gave him a lyre on which he played the sweetest music that was ever heard, and a silver bow with sharp arrows which never missed the mark. When Apollo went out into the world, and men came to know about him, he was called by some the bringer of light, by others the master of song, and by still others the lord of the silver bow. Diana was tall and graceful, too, and very handsome. She liked to wander in the woods with her maids, who were called nymphs. She took kind care of the timid deer and the helpless creatures which live among the trees and she delighted in hunting wolves and bears and other savage beasts. She was loved and feared in every land, and Jupiter made her the queen of the green woods and the chase. Part 2. Delphi Where is the center of the world? This is the question which someone asked Jupiter as he sat in his golden hall. Of course, the mighty ruler of earth and sky was too wise to be puzzled by so simple a thing, but he was too busy to answer it at once. So he said, Come again in one year from today, and I will show you the very place. Then Jupiter took two swift eagles which could fly faster than the storm wind, and trained them till the speed of the one was the same as that of the other. At the end of the year he said to his servants, Take this eagle to the eastern rim of the earth, where the sun rises out of the sea, and carry his fellow to the far west, 
where the ocean is lost in darkness and nothing lies beyond. Then, when I give you the sign, loosen both at the same moment. The servants did as they were bidden, and carried the eagles to the outermost edges of the world. Then Jupiter clapped his hands. The lightning flashed, the thunder rolled, and the two swift birds were set free. One of them flew straight back towards the west, the other flew straight back towards the east, and no arrow ever sped faster from the bow than did these two birds from the hands of those who had held them. On and on they went like shooting stars rushing to meet each other, and Jupiter and all his mighty company sat amid the clouds and watched their flight. Nearer and nearer they came, but they swerved not to the right nor to the left. Nearer and nearer, and then with a crash like the meeting of two ships at sea, the eagles came together in mid-air and fell dead to the ground. "'Who asked where is the center of the world?' said Jupiter. "'The spot where the two eagles lie, that is the center of the world.' They had fallen on the top of a mountain in Greece, which men have ever since called Parnassus. "'If that is the center of the world,' said young Apollo, "'then I will make my home there.' and I will build a house in that place, so that my light may be seen in all lands. So Apollo went down to Parnassus, and looked about for a spot in which to lay the foundations of his house. The mountain itself was savage and wild, and the valley below it was lonely and dark. The few people who lived there kept themselves hidden among the rocks, as if in dread of some great danger. They told Apollo that near the foot of the mountain, where the steep cliff seemed to be split in two, there lived a huge serpent called the python. This serpent often sees sheep and cattle, and sometimes even men and women and children, and carried them up to his dreadful den and devoured them. "'Can no one kill this beast?' said Apollo. And they said, "'No one, and we and our children and our flocks.' shall all be slain by him. Then Apollo, with his silver bow in his hands, went up towards the place where the python lay. The monster had worn great paths through the grass and among the rocks, and his lair was not hard to find. When he caught sight of Apollo, he uncoiled himself and came out to meet him. The bright prince saw the creature's glaring eyes and blood-red mouth, and heard the rush of his scaly body over the stones. He fitted an arrow to his bow, and stood still. The python saw that his foe was no common man, and turned to flee. Then the arrow sped from the bow, and the monster was dead. "'Here I will build my house,' said Apollo. Close to the foot of the steep cliff, and beneath the spot where Jupiter's eagles had fallen, he laid the foundations, and soon, where had been the lair of the python, the white walls of Apollo's temple arose among the rocks. Then the poor people of the land came and built their houses nearby, and Apollo lived among them many years, and taught them to be gentle and wise, and showed them how to be happy. The mountain was no longer savage and wild, but was a place of music and song. The valley was no longer dark and lonely but was filled with beauty and light. "'What shall we call our city?' the people asked. "'Call it Delphi, or the Dolphin,' said Apollo, "'for it was a dolphin that carried my mother across the sea.'" Part Three, Daphne In the Vale of Tempe, which lies far north of Delphi, there lived a young girl whose name was Daphne. She was a strange child, wild and shy as a fawn, and as fleet of foot as the deer that feed on the plains. But she was as fair and good as a day in June, and none could know her but to love her. Daphne spent the most of her time in the fields and woods, with the birds and blossoms and trees, and she liked best of all to wander along the banks of the river Peneus, and listen to the ripple of the water as it flowed among the reeds or over the shining pebbles. Very often she would sing and talk to the river, 
as if it were a living thing and could hear her, and she fancied that it understood what she said, and that it whispered many a wonderful secret to her in return. The good people who knew her best said, She is a child of the river. Yes, dear river, she said, let me be your child. The river smiled and answered her in a way which she alone could understand, and always after that she called it Father Peneus. One day, when the sun shone warm, and the air was filled with the perfume of flowers, Daphne wandered farther away from the river than she had ever gone before. She passed through a shady wood and climbed a hill, from the top of which she could see Father Peneus lying white and clear and smiling in the valley below. Beyond her were other hills, and then the green slopes and wooded top of the great Mount Ossa. Ah, if she could only climb to the summit of Ossa, she might have a view of the sea, and of other mountains close by, and of the twin peaks of Mount Parnassus far, far to the south. Good-bye, Father Peneus, she said. I am going to climb the mountain, but I will come back soon. The river smiled, and Daphne ran onward, climbing one hill after another, and wondering why the great mountain seemed still so far away. By and by she came to the foot of a wooded slope, where there was a pretty waterfall, and the ground was bespangled with thousands of beautiful flowers, and she sat down there a moment to rest. Then from the grove on the hilltop above her came the sound of the loveliest music she had ever heard. She stood up and listened. Someone was playing on a lyre, and someone was singing. She was frightened, and still the music was so charming that she could not run away. Then, all at once, the sound ceased, and a young man, tall and fair, and with a face as bright as the morning sun, came down the hillside towards her. "'Daphne,' he said, but she did not stop to hear. She turned and fled like a frightened deer back towards the Vale of Tempe. "'Daphne!' cried the young man. She did not know that it was Apollo, the lord of the silver bow. She only knew that the stranger was following her, and she ran as fast as her fleet feet could carry her. No young man had ever spoken to her before, and the sound of his voice filled her heart with fear. She is the fairest maiden that I ever saw, said Apollo to himself. If I could only look at her face again and speak with her, how happy I should be. Through brake, through briar, over rocks and the trunks of fallen trees, down rugged slopes, across mountain streams, leaping, flying, panting, Daphne ran. She looked not once behind her, but she heard the swift footsteps of Apollo coming always nearer. She heard the rattle of the silver bow which hung from his shoulders. She heard his very breath, he was so close to her. At last she was in the valley where the ground was smooth and it was easier running, but her strength was fast leaving her. Right before her, however, lay the river, white and smiling in the sunlight. She stretched out her arms and cried, "'Oh, Father Peneus, save me!' Then it seemed as though the river rose up to meet her. The air was filled with a blinding mist. For a moment Apollo lost sight of the fleeing maiden. Then he saw her close by the river's bank, and so near to him that her long hair, streaming behind her, brushed his cheek. He thought that she was about to leap into the rushing, roaring waters, and he reached out his hands to save her. But it was not the fair, timid Daphne that he caught in his arms. It was the trunk of a laurel tree its green leaves trembling in the breeze. "'Oh, Daphne, Daphne!' he cried. "'Is this the way in which the river saves you? Does Father Peneus turn you into a tree to keep you from me?' Whether Daphne had really been turned into a tree, I know not. Nor does it matter now, it was so long ago. But Apollo believed that it was so, and hence he made a wreath of the laurel leaves, and set it on his head like a crown and said that he would wear it always in memory of the lovely maiden. And ever after that the laurel was Apollo's favorite tree, 
and even to this day poets and musicians are crowned with its leaves. Part 4. Deluded Apollo did not care to live much of the time with his mighty kinsfolk on the mountain top. He liked better to go about from place to place and from land to land, seeing people at their work and making their lives happy. When men first saw his fair boyish face and his soft white hands, they sneered and said he was only an idle, good-for-nothing fellow. But when they heard him speak, they were so charmed that they stood spellbound to listen, and ever after that they made his words their law. They wondered how it was that he was so wise, for it seemed to them that he did nothing but stroll about, playing on his wonderful lyre and looking at the trees and blossoms and birds and bees. But when any of them were sick, they came to him, and he told them what to find in plants or stones or brooks that would heal them and make them strong again. They noticed that he did not grow old, as others did, but that he was always young and fair, and, even after he had gone away, they knew not how nor whither, it seemed as though the earth were a brighter and sweeter place to live in than it had been before his coming. In a mountain village beyond the Vale of Tempe, there lived a beautiful lady named Coronis. When Apollo saw her, he loved her and made her his wife, and for a long time the two lived together and were happy. By and by a babe was born to them, a boy with the most wonderful eyes that anybody ever saw, and they named him Aesculapius. Then the mountains and the woods were filled with the music of Apollo's lyre, and even the mighty folk on the mountain top were glad. One day Apollo left Coronis and her child, and went on a journey to visit his favorite home on Mount Parnassus. I shall hear from you every day, he said at parting. The crow will fly swiftly every morning to Parnassus, and tell me whether you and the child are well, and what you are doing while I am away. For Apollo had a pet crow which was very wise and could talk. The bird was not black, like the crows which you have seen, but as white as snow. Men say that all crows were white until that time, but I doubt whether anybody knows. Apollo's crow was a great tattler, and did not always tell the truth. It would see the beginning of something, and then, without waiting to know anything more about it, would hurry off and make up a great story about it. But there was no one else to carry news from Coronis to Apollo, for, as you know, there were no postmen in those days, and there was not a telegraph wire in the whole world. All went well for several days. Every morning the white bird would wing its way over hills and plains and rivers and forests until it found Apollo, either in the groves on the top of Parnassus or in his own house at Delphi. Then it would alight upon his shoulder and say, Coronis is well, Coronis is well. One day, however, it had a different story. It came much earlier than ever before and seemed to be in great haste. Cor, 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 it cried. But it was so out of breath that it could not speak her whole name. What is the matter? cried Apollo, in alarm. Has anything happened to Coronis? Speak, tell me the truth. She does not love you, she does not love you, cried the crow. I saw a man, I saw a man, and then, without stopping to take breath or to finish the story, it flew up into the air and hurried homeward again. Apollo, who had always been so wise, was now almost as foolish as his crow. He fancied that Coronis had really deserted him for another man, and his mind was filled with grief and rage. With his silver bow in his hands, he started at once for his home. He did not stop to speak with anyone. He had made up his mind to learn the truth for himself. His swan team and his golden chariot were not at hand, for now that he was living with men he must travel like men. The journey had to be made on foot, and it was no short journey in those days when there were no roads. But after a time he came to the village where he had lived happily for so many years, and soon he saw his own house, 
half hidden among the dark-leaved olive trees. In another minute he would know whether the crow had told him the truth. He heard the footsteps of someone running in the grove. He caught a glimpse of a white robe among the trees. He felt sure that this was the man whom the crow had seen, and that he was trying to run away. He fitted an arrow to his bow quickly. He drew the string. Twang! and the arrow which never missed sped like a flash of light through the air. Apollo heard a sharp, wild cry of pain, and he bounded forward through the grove. There, stretched dying on the grass, he saw his dear Coronis. She had seen him coming, and was running gladly to greet him, when the cruel arrow pierced her heart. Apollo was overcome with grief. He took her form in his arms, and tried to call her back to life again. But it was all in vain. She could only whisper his name, and then she was dead. A moment afterwards the crow alighted on one of the trees nearby. "'Cor! Cor! Cor!' it began, for it now wanted to finish its story. But Apollo bade it be gone. "'Cursed bird!' he cried. "'You shall never say a word but Cor! 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 all your life!' and the feathers of which you are so proud shall no longer be white, but black as midnight. And from that time to this, as you very well know, all crows have been black, and they fly from one dead tree to another, always crying, Cor! 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 Part V. Disgraced. Soon after this Apollo took the little Aesculapius in his arms, and carried him to a wise old schoolmaster named Charon, who lived in a cave under the grey cliffs of a mountain close by the sea. "'Take this child,' he said, "'and teach him all the lore of the mountains, the woods, and the fields. Teach him those things which he most needs to know in order to do great good to his fellow men.' and Aesculapius proved to be a wise child, gentle and sweet and teachable. And among all the pupils of Charon he was the best loved. He learned the lore of the mountains, the woods, and the fields. He found out what virtue there is in herbs and flowers and senseless stones, and he studied the habits of birds and beasts and men. But above all he became skillful in dressing wounds and healing diseases, and to this day physicians remember and honor him as the first and greatest of their craft. When he grew up to manhood his name was heard in every land, and people blessed him because he was the friend of life and the foe of death. As time went by, Aesculapius cured so many people and saved so many lives that Pluto, the pale-faced king of the lower world, became alarmed. I shall soon have nothing to do, he said, if this physician does not stop keeping people away from my kingdom. And he sent word to his brother Jupiter, and complained that Aesculapius was cheating him out of what was his due. Great Jupiter listened to his complaint, and stood up among the storm clouds, and hurled his thunderbolts at Aesculapius until the great physician was cruelly slain. Then all the world was filled with grief and even the beasts and the trees and the stones wept, because the friend of life was no more. When Apollo heard of the death of his son, his grief and wrath were terrible. He could not do anything against Jupiter and Pluto, for they were stronger than he, but he went down into the smithy of Vulcan, underneath the smoking mountains, and slew the giant smiths who had made the deadly thunderbolts. Then Jupiter, in his turn, was angry, and ordered Apollo to come before him and be punished for what he had done. He took away his bow and arrows, and his wonderful lyre, and all his beauty of form and feature, and after that Jupiter clothed him in the rags of a beggar, and drove him down from the mountain, and told him that he should never come back nor be himself again, until he had served some man a whole year as a slave. And so Apollo went out, alone and friendless, into the world, 
and no one who saw him would have dreamed that he was once the sun-bright lord of the silver bow. End of section 7